Whether you're a beginner or an advanced Helix user, there has been one point or another in your Helix journey where your unit has sounded like absolute crap. So let's fix that. What's up everybody, it's Steve Sterlacci. Today I wanted to talk to you guys about mistakes to avoid for your Line 6 Helix. This is applicable for the PodGo HX Stomp. So before we even start, let me know what the biggest mistakes that you have made with your Helix so far. Put them in the comments below so you could help other users that are gonna be watching this video. Maybe you have something that I haven't covered down there and you can maybe help somebody out. So let me know what your biggest mistake with the Helix was down below. With so many tip videos out there to try to help you guys improve your tone, I thought that YouTube could use a video on what not to do and what to avoid. Things that I've learned along the way, picked up from others and make my preset making a lot easier and my professional life a lot easier because my presets are live ready when I get them there at this point, which is not the case at first. So let's get right into the list. I don't know how many this is. I don't know if it's top five, one of those things or not, but let's just go. First mistake that people make, I guess not first, I don't know. The first mistake I'm gonna talk about that people make is their monitoring situation. So I always see in the forums and the Facebook groups, just got my Helix, what's the best cheap FRFR to get for it? And to me, that makes no sense. Just in this, I get that everybody has budget constraints and budget constraints. Everybody has budget constraints and I get that. But if you're spending 1500 bucks on a unit, why do you want to plug it into a $200 speaker? That kind of doesn't make total sense to me. So I've have I've heard good things about cheap FRFR systems, but me personally, I like the RCF NX12 SMA and I like the Line 6 Power Cabs. Both of those work for me, but if you are looking for a monitoring situation, you just got your Helix, I would first always recommend a good pair of studio cans. Studio monitoring, monitoring headphones are gonna give you great results, sound great, and you don't have to worry about any volume or any issues there. The other thing I would recommend is if it's a home user, if you're gonna be a home user building your presets at home, get the best pair of studio monitors that you can afford if you're gonna be playing at home. That's gonna get you the best tone, the best I guess the best overall experience because if you're playing the backing tracks and stuff, you're gonna want everything to sound good. So I think a good pair of studio monitors for your home setup would be best. If you're playing out live, you really gotta do your research and find out how much size you need and what exactly is gonna work best for you. There's a lot of great options, but don't cheap out on the monitoring situation or you will be unhappy. Another mistake that everybody makes at some point or another is rushing into buying impulse responses. And this I never understood. I used to understand it, I guess, because when I first got the unit, I was one of those because when you read about it, everybody says you need impulse responses, you need impulse responses. That's total crap and it's totally not true. You'd be much better spending your time adjusting and learning how to use the stock cabs, finding out which cabinets, which microphones pair well together and learning to make them on your own. Using a dual cab lock and an EQ pedal after it is the most flexible option you're going to have because you can have two cabinets, two microphones, adjust the distances, you can mix and match the volumes, and then with the EQ, you can put some fine tuning on it. When you get a pack of impulse responses, you get stuck with 250 things in a bundle, and then you gotta sit there and play and cycle through all of them. By the time you pick one you like, and then you finish the list, you're like, you go back to the first one, you're like, did I even like this? And then you just spend way too much time on that. If you do find your perfect impulse response, then great. You already did the work, now it's just gonna be a drop-in situation. But I would overall recommend doing the stock cabs because there are situations in the studio or maybe live where I need a couple of quick adjustments and I want to fine tune my cabinet section and I'm not able to do that with the impulse responses like I am with the stock cabs. You have a lot more flexibility and tweakability with the stock cabs that you'd have to find a totally different impulse response to achieve. So learn your stock cabs. The biggest issue that users, I think, have, and I was guilty of this, I go back to some of my earlier presets and I'm like, what the hell was I thinking, is don't make your presets too loud. I work with people, I give Helix lessons via Skype and via Zoom and stuff, and almost always when I get sent a preset to evaluate and then to give tips on, 99% of the time, if not 100, the preset is way too loud. When the preset's too loud, it taxes the Helix in a way that I just don't think it likes. I'm totally making this up, but in my experience, this is what I've found to be true. The Helix does not like to be blown away, if you wanna think of it that way. So 
the little rule of thumb that I go by is I first start off with a preset blank, just my guitar in and I'll play with nothing. I'll take that volume, get it to where I can hear it well enough to make a preset. And then I start building around that. And then I keep checking on that frequently. I'll bypass the amp, bypass the cabinet, make sure that I'm around about the same volume as that preset, as that bypassed guitar tone. That's gonna let the Helix work in its livable area. That's just how I think of it in my head is that it likes to be in that area. I feel like it's gonna sound the best and have the best touch sensitivity instead of being dimed and having everything cranked up too loud. You're gonna get weird fizziness and weird crackling distortion that you do not want. It gets like this weird harsh clipping that is gonna be really, really annoying and you're gonna say that your Helix sounds like crap when in reality it's just too loud. I think it gets the most warm and natural tone when it's around that bypass volume. It could be a little bit more. I wouldn't go less, but I would go around bypass or a little bit hotter, just not extremely hot. You'll hear a big difference. Too much low end. Every single stock amp that you pull up, I believe has too much low end and it gets really squishy and farty and it's kind of annoying to, to try to find how to fix it at first, but I've just settled on the amps have too much low end to start. So one of the first things I do with my presets is that I dial out some low end instead of turning up everything else. So when you're first using it, you're gonna say, oh, this is gonna be a little bit mushy, so I'm gonna bring up the treble, I'm gonna bring up the presence, and I'm gonna bring up the volume, and that's gonna lead you down a path you don't wanna be in because it's gonna make it harsh, and it's gonna make it really tinny, and it's gonna kill you when you amplify it through a PA system. So first, try dialing out some low end if you're having trouble with that, with a little bit of a squishy, mushy sound. Bring out that low end and uh, see where that gets you. Next one is another too much. There's too much gain. So I think even on the cleanest of amp models, there's too much gain. So to piggyback off of the bass, I bring back the bass and the gain almost immediately on every preset that I have. So if you're struggling with getting good clean tones and you're like, this thing can't do clean tones, I think it does clean tones better than distorted sounds, to be honest. But to get there, you have to bring that gain almost down to zero in some cases. I've had presets where it's on literally 0.0. .0. I've had amps where it's on three. Depends on the amp model, but almost always I'm bringing back that gain immediately. And then to compensate, you need to use your channel volume. So your channel volume is the only parameter on the amp that's not gonna color your tone. Even the master volume colors your tone because it's technically working the modeled preamp, uh, the modeled power amp section. So jacking up that master volume does affect your tone. Channel volume is gonna be where you're at. If you get to max channel volume and you can't go any further, you can futz with the master volume and try to get a little bit, but you will notice a little bit of a difference. If not, you can do a makeup after the cabinet, if you have that EQ block, you could bring up a level on the EQ, or you could do it at the absolute last block, which is the output block. You have up to 20 dB of a boost that you could put there. That's where you should be compensating for your clean presets if they're getting buried in your mix. And the issue that every single Helix user runs into that you really wanna to try to avoid is making your gigging presets at home and thinking that they're gonna translate great to stage or to rehearsal. That will never happen, sorry to tell you. Your presets that you make at home are gonna sound drastically and radically different than when you get full volume with a full band, with a real drummer, real bass player, and a lot of volume happening on stage. So the best way to go about compensating for this, because sometimes you'll, and we're all guilty of this, we've all made this mistake. If you have not made this mistake, you're lying. You'll make a great tone at home on your headphones or on your monitors at home. And you're like, wow, this is great. I can't wait to get up on stage with it. You get on stage with it, sounds like total ass. Happened to me plenty of times until I figured out what I need to do when I'm making my presets. I have a whole video on leveling presets that I'll put up here. That helps a lot with getting your balances right in between presets, but to get the tone right, I use my studio cans. I use DT770s. Description um, has my affiliate links if you wanna check those out. Those have been the best, but I also have to, I monitor uncomfortably loud as like my final touches to my presets. I will literally turn that headphone volume up really, really loud to the point where it's killing me. Put them on and I'll play just a little bit. I don't wanna tax my ears too much, but I'll play it and I can get a good indication if it's gonna to be too harsh live or not because the way studio monitors work, studio cans, I mean, it, it reacts like a PA would. So it's amplifying it the same way that a PA would. So when you really turn it up loud, you'll get all of the 
high end, the grit and stuff that you don't want, and then you can make your adjustments from there. So I'll dial in a basic tone, really jack it up loud in my studio cans, and then make my final adjustments. Once it sounds decent that way, go back to normal so I don't blow my eardrums out. But don't expect your presets to sound exactly the same at home when you get on stage. So that is my list of mistakes that I would love if you would avoid. Again, this is all stuff that I went through, I had to struggle with, and I beat myself over the head with for a long time until I could finally get this thing dialed into where I'm automatic, I can just make presets without any issues. So I hope that this list helps you guys out. Again, I asked everybody if they could put their tips down below or their big mistakes that they made. Scroll down below, leave a comment, find maybe find something that you could find useful down there or maybe you could relate to. And uh, let's get some more discussion about this going. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you in the next video.